Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining today's web conference, NAMS Beef 2017 training. Please note that all participant lines will be muted until the Q&A portion of the call. We'll provide you with instructions on how to ask a verbal question at that point of time. You are welcome to submit written questions during the presentation, and these will be addressed during Q&A. To submit a written question, please use the chat panel on the right-hand side of your screen and choose All Panelists from the Send To drop-down menu. If you require any technical assistance, please send a note to the event producer. With that, I'll turn the call over to Dr. Chuck Fossler. Dr. Fossler, please go ahead. Hello. Uh, thank you all for being on the call today. Um, this is the second and last day of the uh, field training. And today we're going to be focusing on uh, biologic testing and sample collection. And we're going to start off the day with a talk from some folks from IDEX. So I'm going to turn the uh, call over to uh, Bob Stokowski from IDEX, and he's going to be talking about BVD. Thank you, Dr. Foster. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to participate. Um, uh, we're very excited to participate in the NAM study. Uh, we are in, uh, working with K-State in sponsoring the, the BVD testing component of the NAM study, and uh, Dr. Foster kindly allowed us to participate in this morning's uh, uh, conference call to go through a backgrounder on BVD. There is a couple ways to go, uh, go after this, uh, and certainly we can take an academic approach. But we've elected to take uh, a producer-oriented approach, given the mission of the, of the team uh, on this conference call. So the goal, uh, we're happy to answer academic questions uh, or more technical questions, but the, the goal of the meeting for us is, is to communicate from a producer's point of view how, to, how they view or how uh, we could communicate to them uh, the role of BVD in, in managing risk and profitability. So. Uh, Dr. Fossler, do you see the next slide? Yes. Great. Uh, that, so the, that is working. So on the call today, joining me is uh, a few different uh, folks from IDEX. Uh, Ron Kramer uh, has, uh, is uh, one of our field representatives. He's also a producer himself. He probably has more experience uh, with BVD working with more producers than I would, I would uh, guess just about anybody in the country. Uh, and uh, one of the advantages of Ron's experience is not only does he have the experience of speaking to, uh, over the course of you know, decades, uh, but he also is a producer himself, and so he understands firsthand the challenges uh, a producer faces as well as their perception of BVD. Dr. Jim Rhodes is a global bovine veterinarian uh, working with IDEX. Uh, he also has a food animal uh, background. And so from a technical perspective, Jim can certainly address any questions that might come up. Like Ron, he's also a beef producer, so both of them are in cattle country. And uh, Jim was using uh, BVD testing uh, long before he actually joined IDEX. So uh, he, again, has a unique perspective uh, like Ron. Uh, I am the U.S. Uh, General Manager for IDEX's Production Animal Division. And then joining us is also Cliff Young, our Sales and Marketing Manager, and uh, Cliff is on uh, because if uh, one desires any additional follow-up, uh, Cliff can help facilitate that in terms of training, education, support materials, et cetera. So brief, uh, uh, brief agenda on the right-hand side. And by all means, uh, certainly we want to accept any questions that uh, anyone has. And uh, if we do run out of time, we're happy to address those uh, after the call. So with that, let me kick it over to Jim and, uh, Jim and Ron. Thanks, Bob. Um, since the the title is Improving Profitability, uh, in order to understand whether or not we're profitable, we kind of have to have an idea of costs. And in most cases, when you put a slide up like this that has a, a pretty big number, you like to talk about the sources you have. But when you look at this, there are so many sources behind this. At $50 per cow per year, um, that's an estimate of the published data up through about 2015, 2016. Um, it comes out to about $37 per calving. So when I have talked to clients in the past or fellow producers and they say, well, why should I even be worried about BBD? Um, Julia Redpath was involved in that conversation once 
And she said, if you had, as a producer, if you had to write a check for $50 per cow every year, take that money out of your account, producers would get much more serious, if that is a word, uh, about BBD control. So uh, if we go to the next slide, this next slide shows us a sampling of how many peer-reviewed publications are out there across the world. There are more than this, but it goes to show how many fairly good studies and in a personal communication with uh, George Gunn, he's the author of the one from um, third down, I asked him, I said, how confident are you in the numbers? And he said, well, I think they're about half right. And I said, what do you mean, George? And he said, well, he said, if we could capture everything that comes into account on the, the farm side of the equation about what do things really cost, he said, I think it's about double what we report. So um, from an expert standpoint, that's what the literature says, and um, he believes that it could be even higher than that as far as an Im economic impact. So we'll go on to our next slide. When we talk about the effects uh, that BBD has, it affects producers in every U.S. state. Now, I live in Missouri, and, and, and we get labeled as part of the southeast cattle thing. But when we start really looking at the numbers, and now that I've joined IDEX, I have access to the numbers, and we look at prevalence rates, and this is a problem all across the nation. It's affecting everybody. Now, whether it's an effect through actually finding cattle that are persistently infected or mucosal disease calves, um, it affects things all across the disease spectrum because it's immunosuppressive. Um, it's clearly one of the most costly uh, viral diseases in the U.S., but it's a rare event. So when we start talking about doing testing, um, just testing the ones that are sick or the ones that, that you think look like they have BVD is not really going to be a strategy that um, puts a dent in the disease. I'm going to turn the next couple of slides over to uh, my colleague, uh, Ron Kramer, um, and let him uh, speak to those. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I, a uh, little history on myself, I started uh, in the cow feeding business in Kansas in 1984. Prior to that, I was uh, on a ranch in Montana from uh, the early 1950s till 1984. So I've been around this deal for a long time, and I've I've uh, fought a lot of uh, different diseases and tried to keep cattle as healthy and as productive as possible. And I've always considered that to be my job and my my mission in life, so to speak. So when we moved to Kansas in 1984 and I got in the feedlot business, the picture you see in front of you of this, uh, of this uh, steer that is broke with, with mucosal disease, I, I, they, these guys kept me up at night. My job was to uh, uh, reduce death loss and improve and keep uh, feed efficiency as uh, good as we could so that our cost of gains would be uh, would be down. So I learned a lot about BVD by by fighting the battle. And uh, when I learned what BVD was, the battle got a lot easier to fight. So BVD manifests itself in many ways, making it sometimes challenging for producers to identify. This guy's easy to find. The hard one to find is the guy that's the healthy guy standing in the background there that's shedding a huge amount of virus every day. And he would be a subclinical infection. Uh, the guy laying on the ground, of course, as you all know, is clinical. So immunosuppression is a is a huge deal uh, in the cattle business, and it doesn't matter if you're in a, what sector, or what production sector we're talking about. Uh, BVD raises havoc. Uh, repeat breeding problems in a cow herd. I'm also a beef cow producer. Uh, the job my cows have every year is to wean a live calf. So I've got something to sell to pay her feed bill. My job is to make sure I give her the opportunity to do that. And and if I allow 
BVD, persistently infected BVD to be present, I'm not giving her the best opportunity. And consequently, I can suffer from abortion, congenital defects, and this fellow here has acute and chronic mucosal disease. So what I learned when I came to Kansas in 84 and started really seeing things manifest itself in a feedlot really fit, fell over into the production side of my cow-calf operation and our, and our stalker operation as well and uh, made me fully aware that BVD testing pays. Um, the next slide, uh, Please, Jim. I believe this is you. Yep. yep. I'll, I'll I'll take it back. Thanks, Ron. Um, so Ron mentioned there that there were there there are several manifestations, and from the clinical standpoint, sometimes those are easy to see, sometimes they're not. From a testing standpoint, we really have two groups of cattle that are infected with the BVD virus. The transiently infected are the ones that get infected after they're born. And they're exposed to either an, another transient infection or a PI infection, and they become infected, but they cannot become persistently infected. Persistently infected cattle become infected in utero, and that is a lifelong infection. So if we go on to the next um, slide, we'll talk a little bit more about how that persistent, what is a PI calf? Now that's a an acronym, it just stands for Persistent Infected Calf. And these calves get infected sometime between about 20 and 120, 150 days of gestation um, in utero. So their, their mother, the cow gets infected, or she is already infected as a persistently infected animal. She passes that virus on to the calf, and that is before the calf has made a determination of what is self versus non-self. So if you think of it as the calf hasn't yet taken inventory, and when it does towards that 120, 150-day stage of, de of gestation, it recognizes the virus as part of itself, just like it would recognize its arm or its leg. So these calves, while PI, um, they don't recognize the virus as a pathogenic or an invasive uh, element. So when they are born, um, some of them, it affects their, their abilities to survive, and some of them will die within the first couple of years of life. Um, but unfortunately, not all of them are that considerate of the rest of the cow herd, and they grow up, and they spread the virus their entire life. Next slide. This kind of gives us a, a graphical uh, explanation of what we're talking about. So the most common route um, is that a susceptible pregnant cow um, gets infected with the virus, um, is not able to create an immune response quick enough or of a, of a large enough magnitude to keep the virus from crossing the, the uterine of the placental barrier and it gets into the calf. The calf recognizes the virus as itself and it becomes PI when it's born. Or it may abort. There's a lot of different outcomes, but the worst outcome there is actually the calf surviving and being born as a persistently infected virus shedder. The less common route uh, is when you have the cow is actually persistently infected and if the calf survives to term, uh, the persistently infected cow will always give birth to a persistently infected calf if she carries the fetus to term. Um, that's less common, but it is a way that the virus does persist even in vaccinated herds because once you're persistently infected as a calf or as you grow up into a cow, um, you do not recognize that virus as foreign, and so you do not make an immune response to it, and you cannot clear the virus. Uh, there has been one documented clearance uh, of the virus systemically, uh, and that was a Charlet bull called Cumulus, but he was persistently infected in semen and in the testicles his entire life. So a very rare event, but still uh, the most common route is 
a pregnant heifer or cow getting exposed to the virus during pregnancy. Next slide. I think I switched that, get that back over to Ron. Yeah, this one's mine. The impact of a BVD animal affects the entire herd, and this again goes back to some work that was done uh, in the early, mid-2000s in, uh, in feedlots. In a typical feed yard, a few PI animals may expose 60 to 70 percent or more of the total feedlot. And we're going to show a few slides. The next few slides will, will show you uh, how that, how that uh, can happen. But this slide uh, really uh, sends a good message about the difference in shedding rate between a transient layer or an acutely infected animal which would be red dot that you see compared to a persistently infected animal that sheds 10 million viral particles every day of its life of BVD. The transiently infected animal sheds about 1,000 or 10,000 viral particles per day, but clears the infection in 10 to 14 days usually. So, uh, you know, PI cattle are a huge reservoir for virus and um, very few can infect so many, and uh, the, few, the next slides will show that. So uh, next slide, please, Bob. Uh, this was some work that was done uh, by Bill Hessman uh, down in Sublette, Kansas, in the mid-2000s. And what this slide shows, it's hard to see the numbers I know on here, or at least it is for me, but the take-home message of this slide is it compares non-infected pens of cattle to infected pens of cattle, and it looks at the profit drivers that we can really measure quite easily in a feedlot, that being weight gain, uh, average daily gain, feed consumption, feed, which, which is feed conversion, uh, the co total cost of gain, and then morbidity and mortality. And uh, the bottom line is, is that there's about uh, – uh, fifty dollar well a forty one dollar and seventeen cents advantage in these two studies combined per animal in a in a feedlot situation uh, non exposed pens compared to exposed pens pens that are exposed to a pi either by having a persistently infected animal present in that pen or being a neighbor to that pen and sharing the uh, being being exposed to the virus through the air. So uh, next slide, please, Bob. This uh, chart just shows the prevalence rate at four, four per thousand, and we see that consistently across the United States. We, we look at the data from numerous labs that we work with, testing labs uh, scattered across the United States, and we look at different weight classes of cattle, different regions, different origins. Four tenths or four per thousand has been been the norm for a long time, and it still is. Uh, lighter weight cattle, of course, have have a few more, and, and heavier weight cattle have a few less. But average out of all the cattle that are tested, and most of those would be coming in that to stocker backgrounders or feedlots. That four per thousand. So. Uh, on, on the far right, you'll see the four per thousand recognized with the red circle on the top. And if you buy, if you're if you're in the stalker business or you're a cattle feeder and you buy 500 cattle, you've got an 86 percent, 86.5 percent chance of buying a persistently at least one persistently animal in those 500. Of course, as you buy more, purchase more cattle, your odds go up to 100 percent, and uh, but this chart just shows how important it is to test cattle upon arrival or have the opportunity to purchase tested cattle. Risk is a function of PI prevalence and the number of animals, and that's documented in this chart. And again, that's, this, this recognizes a lot of work and a lot of data gathered over a number of years from across the United States. We didn't pick on one region of the country or another. This is this is an accumulation of, of uh, data from numerous testing labs. Uh, next slide, please, Bob. This is a feed yard exposure risk uh, randomizer. We used to we call this our pen randomizer, 
And you can play with this, and we've got it in a form, and we can send that to you, if you upon request, and you can uh, you can play with it, and you can say, okay, this is a 10,000 head feed yard, uh, 100, the pen size is 100 head, number of pens is 100, uh, number of adjacent pens per alley is 20, so there's 20 pens on each side of the alley. Yeah. Uh, Again, we used four per thousand as the uh, uh, persistently infected rate, um, and then we used the cost per exposed animal based upon, again, a, a study that was done by Bill Hessman down at uh, Sublette, Kansas, uh, $67.49 is what he found the exposed pens to um, uh, non-exposed pens had a $67.49% closeout advantage over exposed pens across the feed yard. So it took out, by doing that, you kind of, you, you kind of average out the quality of cattle, uh, region of, of, uh, cattle and steers and heifers. And it's a pretty good blend of, of cattle throughout a feed yard when you do something like this. And people can say, well, yeah, but did you pick out all the good steers from Montana? No, we didn't. It was, the study was, was average uh, based on averages. So then you look at, uh, uh, you know, the total <laughs> total PIs introduced was 40. The actual observed prevalence again four per thousand. And when you scatter those 40 out in a 10,000 head feed yard just randomly, the dark darker shaded pens, the dark blue pens would would indicate those that contain a PI animal persistently infected animal. The lighter blue pens would, the lighter uh, kind of gray pens would be um, those that were exposed by that persistently infected animal being in a neighboring pen. And the ones that are clear, uh, that are white, would be pens that were not exposed. So this is random. You can do it however you want to. We've had veterinarians that say, okay, I'm going to put three tents in. Well, go ahead. You're still going to expose a lot of the cattle in the feed yard. So bottom line is the observed cost per animal in the exposed pens was $47.92. Uh, the total affected uh, dollar effect that PIs had at four tents, four per thousand in a 10,000 head feed yard, $479,200. And the total cost for testing, and we use three dollars and fifty cents per individual test. And if you if you if you uh, ask the testing labs that run uh, BVD Elizas across the United States, you'd find that that's a pretty good average per test of what they charge to run it. So for thirty five thousand dollars, you could have tested those ten thousand cattle. And uh, so take home message from this is. It pays to test. Um, next slide, please, Bob. Wow, Ron, that's a <clears throat> that's a fabulous chart, and so that kind of makes us think: Well, are those calves that are pre-tested are they worth more? And what we find out is yes. And I've had this same uh, personal experience. Um, we we all wish we could continue to sell calves uh, at the 20, 2014, 2015 rate. But that year, my own calves um, produced about a, a $25 per head increase in, in price over non-PI tested animals. So uh, this is some data from Superior uh, that showed a $2.42 per hundred weight um, more for cattle that were BVD negative tested. And one thing that a friend of mine, Dr. Dave Sokocha, uh, told me, uh, he said, I'm not going to tell you exactly what uh, we think we're making in the feed yards he consults for uh, because by BBD testing. But he said, we wouldn't still be doing it if we weren't making money doing it. And I thought that was a statement that was just right along with all the data we've seen and my personal experience that if it costs the feed yard that much for these cattle moving up through, that's only part of the chain. Um, what is that, if we have that kind of data, what is it costing me at the cow-calf level? So while that number is a little harder to get to, we saw it in the first slide, but now we see how much more you can get 
per hundred weight um, if you're selling calves that are already BVDPI negative, and that doesn't include the amount of money you gain in management and, and all the performance attributes that occur at the cow-calf level. So there is a economic reason, and it does have a good return on investment, as you can see. Next slide. So when we start talking about maximum protection strategies, I've spent a lot of my career working on vaccines and trying to produce vaccines that will provide enough protection um, that we don't have as big an impact from BVD. But the, the global aspect of BVD has shown us now that while we need to have good protection strategies from vaccines and bioprotection, one of the most <clears throat> positive strategy, strategy, uh, strategies for producing cattle and, and having the best return on our investment is to test and remove the PIs. So all of these things we've been talking about, about exposures and, and how much the animals shed the virus, it all comes down to within the herd, if the best thing we can do is test cattle and remove the ones that are PI positive. Um, that is the absolute best way to have a healthy herd. And there's a lot of things that we could talk about here about a healthy herd, but establishing that and then following it up with a vaccination and a good biosecurity program um, allows us to produce healthy cattle and healthy cattle are profitable. So lots of other things that go with this as far as antibiotic usage and things like that. But it's, it's not a one size or a one step is the best way, but there is a one step that has to start at the beginning and that's testing and removing PI animals. The vaccination and biosecurity are, are ways to mitigate reintroduction. Next slide. So the, the surveillance <clears throat> and, and biosecurity strategies. Um, while biosecurity um, is, is something that has lost some of its shine here lately, um, it's still extremely important. Um, fences, um, not having uh, the neighbor's bull that comes over that you have no control over um, is, is expensive extremely important, um, but the one thing we do have control over is our testing strategy. And when surveillance kind of equals testing strategy, and we don't want to miss an opportunity to make sure we identify the virus. So aborted fetuses, calves that die, um, all introductions to a herd, um, we've experienced an unbelievable growth these last two or three years, really since 2012, uh, in the U.S. Uh, cow herd. That means there's a lot of people retaining heifers, but if you look at the heifer markets for bred heifers, um, those prices have been very good for those selling. And so people are adding heifers to their herd. You can't test the fetus but you sure can test that heifer, and then you have to test the calf as soon as it's born. So a, a testing strategy uh, is absolutely paramount to us controlling this disease. And it may sound um, optimistic, but we there are countries uh, in Europe and Eastern Europe that either have eradicated the disease or are in the process of doing so. They've made some mistakes, but they've also got a whole lot of things right. And a recent article I read showed that there was a 300 million euro return on investment in the Bavarian region of Germany alone. That's the largest cattle region in Germany. Um, that's a lot of money. And those producers are seeing that return on investment from removing this virus. And the way they did it was with testing and removal of the PI animal. So, Ron, I'm going to turn it over to you, and, and Ron's going to talk a little bit about how we find those PI animals and some testing strategies. Yes, uh, we get a question every time I do a producer meeting uh, or a veterinarian meeting. I, I get a 
how, what do I do with them when I find them? Well, don't put them back in commerce because that's not the right thing to do. But um, we always recommend that, that if you're a producer, you consult with your veterinarian to determine appropriate measures. Um, the Academy of Veterinary Consultants recommends that you euthanize PI cattle or isolate PI cattle. And in most cases, uh, and at the cow-calf level, if you test early, which you should do, you should always test. We, I recommend, we recommend that you test your calves before you turn your bulls out because you don't want a persistently infected animal or calf out there during gestation. Uh, one, one persistently infected animal, if you remember the flow chart that Jim showed on how a, cat, a persistently infected animal's form can turn into many. Ron, we can't hear you. Can you hear me? There you are. Okay. I lost you for a second there. Okay. Uh, so uh, do not uh, allow one ca calf to walk around that's not that's a persistently infected animal during gestation. That's the first message that I'll give you. So younger animals on cow-calf operations are typically euthanized. Uh, it's hard to isolate a cow or calf pair and keep them quarantined from the herd. So usually uh, most cow-calf guys, when they find one and they're testing early on, which you should do, they, they euthanize that calf, and then they test that cow, and most times she'll be negative. If she is positive, of course, you want to remove her from the population. And um, one thing to remember is that BVD is not a food safety issue. So these animals that are persistently infected are not dangerous to the food chain. So in a cow, if, at the cow level, of course, you can, you can take those to and uh, you can uh, uh, sell them into, uh, uh, they can be hamburger, they can become a hamburger at McDonald's and they're perfectly safe to eat. Cattle at feed yards are typically isolated in a quarantine pen, same with stock or background or operations, and those cattle are kept quarantined until they reach a, a, a weight range that, that the, for the, that's manageable for, again, for, for, for uh, uh, a food, they turn, you know, they're, they're perfectly safe to, uh, to, uh, eat later. Uh, customers report that 50 to 60 percent of PI quarantined animals typically make it to market weight. And I've talked to a lot of feed garden managers that test and have quarantine pens over the years, and that 50 to 60 percent is, is really accurate. Uh, they say that, and that's been my experience too, if you keep them past 100 days, there's something about finding these cattle and putting them in a quarantine pen and keeping them, uh, if you keep them past 100 days, they're gonna start dying off for some reason. And if you if you put a wild strain of BVD, persistently infected BVD in that quarantine pen, you're gonna lose, a, you're gonna lose some cattle too because it'll heat those persistently infected BVD that are in there it will give them a, a round of BVD that they're not, that they don't have, and they can't fight it off, and those rascals will turn mucosal and die on you in a hurry. So um, quarantine pens are great. They say, you know, a 50-foot barrier between the quarantine pen and other cattle is enough. Uh, I, I think out in western Kansas where the wind blows, it might not be enough that virus can probably fly further than that, but, uh, um, you know, we never took one out of there to doctor him. If he gets sick, he's going to, there's nothing you can do. There's no need in wasting antibiotics on him. He's going to die, and that's just the way it is. But remember, they're not a food safety issue. Corn cattle can move from a quarantine pen into the food chain without, uh, without any food safety issues. So uh, next slide, please, Bob. Myths. This slide covers some some common myths about PI cattle, and again, this is based off of questions that we've all been asked over the years. Uh, PI calves will be killed by modified live vaccination. That's absolutely not true. 
uh, a PI calf will be thin, have a rough hair coat, and be a poor doer. Sometimes they are, but not all the time, and very seldom can you, uh, there's more, I found that there's more health calves there are that are not showing any clinical sign or congenital sign of BVD than there are others. Um, calves are PI because their dams are PI. That's not true. Am I on the call? You are. Yes, you are. Yeah, Ron. Okay. My phone is just acting really strange. Calves are PI because their dam is PI. That's true. If the, if their if their dam is positive, a positive cow will always have a positive calf. But over 95% of the time, the cow is infected during gestation, which Jim showed in that in his flow chart. And uh, it's not the cow's fault. It's your fault for allowing that PI calf to exist in your herd. And the greatest cost associated with a PI calf is the death of that calf. That's absolutely wrong. The best thing that can happen is for that calf to to die because every every minute he's alive, he's shedding a huge amount of virus and infecting other cattle, and it costs it, it costs a huge amount of money to have around. So the sooner he's gone, the better. If they'd all die at birth, it'd be great. BVD won't affect my cattle because I vaccinate. Vaccine is great, a great way to protect the cattle, but it's not a preventive. It works. I've worked with a lot of good, what I consider to be top technical veterinarians for vaccine companies over the years, doing producer programs across the United States, and they, I've heard it. I've heard them say many times: if you test and remove persistently infected animals from your herd, our vaccine works a lot better. If you remove that immunosuppression, uh, give that vaccine a chance to work, it's, 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 it's a whole lot better. So vaccine alone will not solve the BVD problem, but you certainly want to continue to vaccinate as part of the biosecurity program. Um, next slide, please, Bob. So how do I start testing my cattle for BVD? First thing, you use a USDA-licensed BVD PI, ELISA, or BVD on farm test, which IDEX manufactures both of those. We have our SNAP test for on-farm testing. It's a 20-minute test, widely used by, by veterinarians and producers across the United States. Uh, tests are run on an individual animal basis for the most accurate results. When you talk about an IDEX test and ELISA test, our, our lab-based ELISA or our on-farm SNAP test, uh, they're both licensed by USDA for one sample at a time. Uh, testing is simple. The producer collects an ear notch and sends it to the laboratory or, pre pre or prepares it on for the on-farm test. The sample collection is the same for both. The sample collection tube needs to be marked and identified to the animal, of course. You have to use, uh, we recommend an ear notch. Our sample, our tests work either on serum or ear notch, but ear notch is the, best, is the most widely used. Uh, it's easier for, uh, for producers and veterinarians to, um, to take, and it's also a, a, a mark. When you see a calf with an ear notch in his ear, uh, some some ranches ear notch for identification, but most of the time, when you see an ear notch, at least you know there's a pretty good chance that calf may have been tested for BVD. Uh, so it's a mark of of something you've done something to that animal. Um, you want to make sure that you disinfect the ear notch or in between animals because uh, if the virus is is on the ear notcher, it Cannot, it does not infect the animal, the next animal that you pull a sample from, but it can infect the sample. And if you, if that happens, you can, you can get a false positive. So you want to make sure that when you talk to folks, you recommend that they disinfect their ear notcher in between animals, and we recommend a Nolison solution. The blue Nolison solution really works well, and it's readily available at most 
everyone's farm store. So you can use either the in in lab ELISA or on farm SNAP, both available through uh, IDEX, and we've got laboratories, uh, State Department of Ag Labs, veterinary diagnostic labs, privately owned labs that are most of them are owned by veterinarians across the United States that offer testing through their lab facility. Um, next slide, please, Bob. Testing is critical, and I think we've covered that pretty well in the, pri in the previous slides. We've showed you what it can do to a feedlot where it has a $41, uh, it, it costs all the cattle in a 10,000 head feed yard $41 a head, costs the exposed cattle in a feed yard over $60 a head. So on a cow-calf operation, it's, it, it, it just really raises, raises havoc with a cow-calf operation with abortions and absorptions early on, backs your cabin up, lighter if you've got uh, a PI calf in a pasture exposing your other calves, the immunosuppression causes, you know, will cause your whole calf crop to be lighter at weaning time and we sell pounds. So testing is the only way to identify PI animals. You cannot go out and pick them out visually. Early testing is critical so the PI animals can be removed before they spread infection. Removing PI animals is the best way to reduce overall production losses and impact medical costs on a herd, and BVD-tested calves may bring added value on sale day, but the real added value is is in increased productivity in your in your herd, whether you're a beef cow-calf producer, a dairy, uh, a stalker backgrounder, or, uh, or a cow feeder. Um, Having persistently infected BVD around is is not good, and it's it's so easy to to test and remove those animals. Um, there's such good tests available today, quick turnaround time. Uh, it just really makes no sense to me not to test. Next next test, Bob, please. So a summary of key points, BVD is one of the most serious pathogenic viruses in cattle. PI calves shed tremendous quantities of virus and are the main source of BVD transmission. BVD challenges overall animal and herd health and jeopardizes producer profitability. And preventing exposure is key. PI calves must be identified before they can be eliminated. So use a reliable test. IDEX BVD antigen testing is an economical and effective tool for BVD control. And I think we've covered these key points very well in the presentation, at least I hope we have. And so how do I begin testing? I begin testing, to begin testing for BVD PI, consult with your veterinarian and or a diagnostic laboratory that offers BVD testing services. And like I said, we've got labs across the United States that we can we can send a lab list. Their lab list is on our website. Um, they're easy to contact, and they're very good at giving great service. Contact your IDEX or distributor representative for on-farm BVD SNAP test options. We distribute through AHI, MWI, and several other distribution outlets. Again, contact us for a list of those. And for more information on BVD testing or to find the laboratory nearest you, contact IDEX customer service at 800-548-9997 or visit our website. And we can, we'll do all we can to uh, help facilitate BVD testing at, at the best route possible. Next slide, Bob. I think you covered that, Ron. Pardon? I think you covered the, I think you covered this one. 
Yeah. Next slide, Bob. Ron, we can't hear you. Uh, the next slide should be yours, Bob. Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> So uh, we obviously want, uh, or want to support uh, the NOM study in whatever way possible. Um, and and uh, while testing is our wheelhouse, uh, certainly just from an education perspective, uh, we're happy to provide additional support uh, in whatever way uh, anyone deems uh, appropriate. So we do have uh, a, a number of interactive on-demand uh, and also live webinars available. So if anybody's interested in that, we can certainly point you in the right direction or participate. We have, uh, just like in JAM and others, we have uh, scientific and educational resources. Um, we have uh, information that is uh, education-based that is really around producer education and speaks a producer language versus the technical language. Happy to visit uh, on farm and happy to do veterinary consults uh, if, again, if anyone sees value in those things. And I think, Dr. Fossler, uh, that wraps our portion of the presentation. We're happy to take questions. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to ask a verbal question, please press pound two on your telephone keypad. And if you wish to send in written questions, please use the chat panel on the right-hand side of your screen, and please select all panelists from the send to drop-down menu. One more time, if you wish to ask a verbal question, please press pound two on your telephone keypad. Dr. Foster, we do have a question that has come in, a written question. Yes, so we have a question of Dr. Tobias. Uh, so are most feedlots now testing for BVD? Ryan, you want to take that? Ron, if you're talking, we can't hear you. Most feedlots are trying to purchase uh, PI tested cattle before they arrive at the feed yard. Um, there's a few feed yards that are testing, but most of them uh, are not. They uh, most stock or backgrounders are testing, however, so they're testing prior to arrival at the commercial feed lots. Ron, I'm, this is Jim. I might jump in on that. Um, <clears throat> one of my uh, good friends from high school is the veterinarian at Joplin Regional Stockyards, Dr. Ted Dahlstrom. And uh, this year they'll test about 80,000 head. And those are going into backgrounding uh, operations before they're being shipped onto the feed yard. And those are primarily five, six weight calves. So um, the, the feed yards are looking for a source of clean cattle because the, there were several studies done at both Auburn and uh, Michigan State looking at the impact of that PI animal in a close confinement, i.e. a transport truck or a pot. And that's a very good way to spread the virus in very close quarters over a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. So many of the feed yards have recognized that there is value in these calves being purchased um, that are negative for BVDPI before they ever get on the truck to head to the feed yard. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We have another question. Um, other than IDEX, what other pharmaceutical companies carry the test kits? Ron, do you want to answer that? Yeah, um, pharmaceutical companies that 
carry test kits for BVD, um, I believe, uh, you know, IDEX is not a pharmaceutical company. We're, manu we're a manufacturer of diagnostics, but as far as pharmaceutical companies that carry test kits, I believe the only one that comes to my mind that would fall under the pharmaceutical company heading would be, um, I, I believe Zoetis has acquired a BVD test kit. Uh, but uh, I don't honestly don't know much about that kit and uh, don't know how it compares with ours or how it works, but uh, that would be my knowledge. Jim, you may know uh, what, what do you, do you have any other information on that? Uh, <clears throat> yes, the only, the only country that that kit or that test is currently licensed in is Belgium and uh, it's currently not being sold or marketed in that market. It has been registered and licensed, but there have been no sales yet. So IDEX would be the only, uh, again, we're not a pharmaceutical company, and they're, they're on the ELISA side in the U.S. I, I think we've got, you know, we've got a USDA licensed product that's manufactured and sold in the U.S. And my gosh, I, I don't think I'm wrong by saying we that's it. That's the only one that on the ELISA side. There's some PCRs around, but on the ELISA side. Hey, um, this is Cliff. I, I heard the question a little bit differently to um, the other uh, ways to get SNAP BVD or especially SNAP BVD could also be through MWI, AHI, and other distributors in the U.S. and Canada. I don't know if that helps. Okay, thanks. We have another question. Should you test for PI before you vaccinate? If you vaccinate, does it help suppress the effects of the infection? Jim, you want to sure. take that? Yeah. yeah, I'll take that. So the point of a vaccine is it does three things. Um, I'm going to answer it in kind of reverse order. It reduces the severity, frequency, and, and the magnitude with which disease occurs. It will not eliminate infection or and it will not eliminate the virus. What it does is it gives the animal or you and I, if we have a flu vaccine, it gives us a better chance of fighting off the infection. Now how that relates to PI testing, um, the the it's a numbers game. So the the number of virus that's in a PI animal is exponentially larger than the vaccine dose. And also the vaccine dose is either killed or somehow attenuated or less virulent. So that gives the immune system of the animal an advantage in that it can control the replication. It sees the virus. It says, ah, oh, this, is, this is not good, and it makes an immune response to it. By and large, many persistently infected animals, as they see the virus as part of themselves, unless the vaccine virus is substantially genetically different from the PI virus that they are infected with, they may not make an, uh, an immune response to the vaccine whatsoever. So really, it, it doesn't matter in which order you do things, but your vaccine is really designed to reduce reinfection. So the sooner you can, you can test and remove, um, is better. Um, on my herd, logistically, uh, when we're tagging calves, we're taking a BVD sample. And we're also vaccinating them at the same time. Now, I'm eight, nine years into testing uh, with my herd. So I've been doing this for a long time. We did find three BVD PIs the first time we did it. We haven't found anything since. So um, the, the vaccine is more of a post-eradication on your herd type of, of process, but it has very little effect, if any, uh, when you're doing testing. So thank you. We have another question. 
Does the IDEX test need to be conducted by a veterinarian or are farm personnel allowed to run it? Is it a complicated procedure? Ryan, you want to take that? Yeah. Uh, BVD SNAP is not complicated. Uh, BVD SNAP is an easy, easy test to run. Uh, we do strongly recommend that a veterinarian is involved in the process, though. Producers, uh, producers run BVD SNAP all the time uh, across the United States, but most of the time it's under the direction of a veterinarian. He shows them how to run it. He's probably purchased the BVD SNAP from one of our suppliers or direct from IDEX, and then he has given or sold that product, however he does it, to a, to a producer to use on farm. If he's comfortable, it's a producer can run it. The answer is producers can run the test. It's very simple to run uh, and uh, uh, extremely accurate. So. Uh, yeah, but we try our best to keep the veterinarian involved. And, and if it would help, we have a one-page how-to guide as well as a, just a couple-minute video on how to run it. And I would, I would concur with Ron. If if I can run it, anybody can run it. It's it's a very. Small... <laughs> okay, thank you. We have another question. If a cow calf operator tests all the young calves routinely. Can those animals be sold as non-PI at weaning, or would an additional test be required to sell them as non-PI? If they're tested, this is Ron, and Jim can jump in here as well, but you test them once, they're either negative or positive. A PI is a PI at birth, and um, that status does not change. So you test them one time. And that's all you have to do on that set of calves because they're either positive or negative, and that status does not change. And our test is USDA licensed and validated. So if they're tested with an IDEX test, whether that's a laboratory test or SNAP test, that's, they're both USDA licensed and validated. So you've got a, a valid test and um, for a persistently infected BVD. And as part of the NOM study, uh, K-State is running the ELISA test primarily because uh, that is a, that is uh, a high volume approach to testing. Uh, SNAP tests tend to be uh, a lower volume, hence we see producers running the SNAP and, and labs like, like K-State, other universities, uh, running the ELISA test. But both are comparable in terms of results. Okay, we have another question. How widely is the BVD PI problem known by producers world nationwide? Ryan, I, mean, I could I could grab this one too, and Jim can jump in. As, as that I've been working on producer education for a long time, and um, you know it used to be like uh, I used to say it's kind of like pushing a log chain uphill. It seemed like I was never going to get anywhere, but all of a sudden, the last <clears throat> two or three years, it's been, you know, you hear about an overnight success, and we're not we're not there yet, but gosh, we've gained a lot of, uh, of, of momentum. It seems like uh, on the producer side, it's getting there. There's been articles, you know, you uh, uh, Farm and Ranch magazines, livestock magazines, and, and newspapers have talked about. There's been a lot of meetings about it uh, across the country. And so I think producers are pretty well aware of PVD for the most part. Yeah, Ron, I, I would second that. Um, two, two changes I've noticed in the last five years is when I go to a bull sale now, I haven't been to one or even seen one advertised in probably the last two or three years that all of the bulls being sold are not PI negative. They've all been tested and they are PI negative. Uh, the other thing that just came out and became effective January the 1st is BVD became a reportable disease in the state of Missouri. Um, a couple of years ago, it, uh, it became against the law in the state of Kentucky to knowingly 
sell a BVD persistently infected animal. Now that knowingly uh, is is pretty key there. You have to know because, like Ron said, you can't go out and visually pick out BVD PI animals. Um, so I think awareness is increasing in the U.S., but I think we still have some some distance to go um, because. There's still uh, a lot of calves and, and a lot of herds that have BVD, and they should be testing. And I really think the only reason they're not is because they don't understand the impact that it is having in their herd. Because it's a uh, – Dr. Julia Ridpath was head of the um, uh, government lab in Ames, Iowa, with BVD and is probably the world's foremost expert. And she was quoted in Hordes Dairyman about five years ago saying that, BVD infection in your herd is similar to being nibbled to death by a duck. And if that doesn't give you a, a visual image, boy, um, I, I can draw you a picture. But that's, that's really uh, how insidious this disease is, and um, I think we can still get some more awareness, but more and more people are aware of what it is and how easy it is to test and remove. And uh, we do have a raised hand here. Caller, please go ahead. Your line has been unmuted. Here, what part do servers play in the transmission of BVD? Um, I want to make sure I, I, I do, you mentioned servants. So yeah. uh, um, you're talking about. Uh, Deer, uh, or let's just take it as wild animals in general. <laughs> um, there are some genotype um, specifics uh, as far as di as far as demonstrating transmission between cattle and and other non bovine species. Um, meaning, I'm just going to lump deer, elk. Uh, camel, New World camelids in, into all of this, uh, sheep um, as well. Um, while those transmission studies have been done, most of them have been done at Auburn, and the virus goes both ways, meaning that the cattle can infect um, other ruminant species as well as the other ruminant species infecting back into the cattle. Um, it seems to be more of a genotype one um, common um, virus infection, the genotype 2, and, and other genotypes do not seem to be as uh, prevalent as far as being able to do that, but it does occur, and it is a biosecurity risk. But I will, I will caution you on that. Uh, we have plenty of infection going around in our cow herds. Um, if I was going to say which is the most important, um, I am not worried about uh, the deer that eat in in the hay pile with my cows. Um, and I've been BVD free for about 11 years now. I test every year, and um, I have a significant number of deer that seem to think I am their winter forage source. So does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Excellent question, though, because that that was that was suspected to be responsible for reintroduction of the virus into Germany after they eradicated it the first time. While not well proven, um, it was a very big risk factor that they looked at. But they stopped vaccinating. So they created a naive herd, and that's why Ron and I stress Testing and removal is the way to get the best bang for your buck on controlling the disease and its outcomes, but continuing to vaccinate so that you don't have a naive herd will mitigate the reintroduction risk, and especially from other ruminant species. Okay, we did have a comment saying that my pharmaceutical company has the BVD snap tests on back order. Uh, we we are not on back order right now. Uh, 
so it may be that they just, for, for some reason in terms of their own inventory, um, that's something we can follow up on if, if you uh, want to share who that is. But, but we have plenty of product. Okay, we also have another question. Uh, does the 4 in 1,000 prevalence rate hold for both beef and dairy feeders? Um, act, yes, pretty much. Um, there's uh, some consulting veterinarians around that consult with uh, <clears throat> dairy calf ranches to find prevalence rates higher than that when they first start to test, and then you know, as they find PIs and remove them and clean berries up. But that four per thousand, like I said in my, you know, when I was talking about it, that's, we, we pulled that number from a lot of, uh, of testing that was done over a large area, of, well, throughout the United States on both. And our labs that run the test run it on both beef and dairy, so it's a combination of both now. I'd have to look at the data and look and see, but um, I think it's pretty pretty consistent, pretty consistent between beef and dairy. I second that, Ron. I, the, the studies that are published um, both in and outside the U.S., uh, that is in it for that weight range. And, and I will say when you're looking at prevalence numbers, especially with BVD, Please fully understand that as the age of the of the sampled group gets older, the prevalence rate goes down because some of them do have the courtesy to die, um, but not all of them. So that five to six hundred weight cattle, that 0.45 percent prevalence rate is pretty much repeatable, and it doesn't seem to um, uh, have a preference between beef and dairy cattle. You know, I might add that it's it's it, it, it stays so steady there too. I mean, we've looked at this over the years now for at least ten years that I can remember, and it was four per thousand then, and it's still four per thousand. You know, we haven't we haven't gained any ground. We haven't lost any ground. We're we're testing more cattle now than we did ten years ago, for sure. But we, uh, you know, it, it, the 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 infection rate stays about the same. To, to Ron's point, um, we're testing more cattle than, than we used to. Uh, you may find that uh, the interest here is much higher versus uh, the last knob study. As an example, our, uh, the SNAP test specifically is growing at about 25% a year. So, you know, we, we certainly equate that to greater awareness and greater utilization. Uh, because it's a low volume test, it, it, that tends to be representative of a wider uh, use of the product versus a heavier use of the product. Okay, we did get some clarification about that uh, back order. Uh, that was MWI that we said was where it was back ordered. Cliff, is that something we can follow up on? Is it, my, my sense is that maybe just one warehouse versus the whole company? Yeah, the, the way that the regions work is uh, there are several uh, mega warehouses that, uh, let's say you're in Colorado, you, you can order from that mega warehouse or another local warehouse, but let's say there's inventory in Indiana, but your region doesn't draw from that Indiana warehouse, it'll show, and, and there's nothing available at the mega warehouse, it'll show back order. So that's really, it's not an IDEX back order, it might be just them coordinating with their warehouses to have inventory at all of them. So if there's, if there's a back order, uh, you know, if they're saying back order, just uh, you could give Ron or, or myself a call or, or IDEX directly and, and get it through us. I think we have one one last question. Uh, does uh, BVD spread also include domestic ruminants? I assume they mean sheep or goats by that. I'll uh, I'll take that one. Um, sheep and goats are or what is considered a dead end host for the baby virus. So uh, while they can become infected, 
they can spread the virus. It would be at a much lower level of viral spread. Uh, the virus numbers are going to be much less. Um, but this BVD is a member of a group of pestiviruses, uh, and they're, they have their own uh, pestiviruses. Uh, border disease of sheep uh, is a good example. Um, but while those viruses can cross species, they don't do it efficiently. And so I would not be concerned about uh, sheep or goats being a reservoir for BVD. Um, but that doesn't mean that we haven't diagnosed BVD uh, in sheep. Um, there was a study in Colorado, uh, Hanna Van Kampen did it, and they looked at um, BVD infection in bighorn sheep, wild bighorn sheep, and they found it. And it was, it was creating persistent infections. Um, in the bighorn sheep population. So once again, it's possible. Um, it's much less of an issue than cow-to-cow -cow transmission, though. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, that's, um, I think we need to move on. Um, and I want to thank uh, Bob and Ron and Jim and Cliff for uh, being with us today. And uh, we're going to take a 10-minute uh, break. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, thank everybody. You. Okay, hello, uh, welcome back. Uh, next up we have uh, Dr. Terry Swecker from Virginia Tech, who's going to be talking about, uh, about forage testing. Okay, I'll turn it over to Terry now. Thank you, uh, welcome from Blacksburg. I'm joined here today with Dr. Lauren Dodd, our nutrition resident, and uh, hopefully we can answer any of your questions about the hay sampling protocol associated with the study. Uh, to start off with the first slide, this comes from Dr. Larry Cora, who many of you may know, uh, but he basically outlined that a cow, when it comes to nutrient requirements, goes through four periods each year. And so on the slide, on the x-axis, time zero would be the day she calves. And the first period lasting about 60 to 80 days is basically when she is ramping up lactation to support that calf. and we will consider that she will lose weight during that period. Then shortly after that period, we want to get her bred again so she calves every year. But truly our goal from a nutrition standpoint is from breeding her until the time she weans, we want her to basically hold her weight. Then we have an opportunity the day we wean the calf to dramatically decrease the requirements as you can hopefully see on the lines for either TDN or energy on the top or protein on the bottom. And this is our true opportunity to, uh, in any given year to put weight on a cow. And then once we reach those last two months of gestation, again, it's hard to put weight on that cow, so we want her to hold weight. And so part of the goal of life is when we're using hay is can we help the cow make it through these four periods through uh, uh, feeding of hay to supplement any pasture or forage that is available. And so part of that routinely is we got to know how good or how bad the hay is. And so the example here, two veterinary students uh, coring a round bell. And we can uh, hopefully the videos on how to properly core have been shared with you. But some key points is on a round bell or a large square, you go in on the, either the round side or the twine side to get the best sample of the hay bale rather than going in uh, the end of a square bale or the non-twine side of any wrap bale. So taking any biopsy requires the, uh, the correct technique and uh, likewise anytime we sample hay we want to have the correct technique associated with it. Uh, why do we sample hay? Realistically it's because it's an incredibly variable feed resource. Uh, Grains tend to be pretty routinely the same, silages the same way, but hay can be anything from incredibly good to incredibly bad. And one of the challenges for all our producers is trying to match this uh, intersecting lines between quality and quantity. That basically any 
forage as we let it mature is going to provide more pounds, but also during that period as it's maturing, it's lower quality. So depending on uh, the needs of the producer, the ability to harvest hay at the right time, we can have either something that um, my father's term was, it's a little bit better than snowballs, just something that's an incredibly high quality feed. Uh, likewise, hay may or may not be uniform. It may have a high content of weeds, rocks, dirt, dead critters, uh, all those other options that end up in a hay bale. And then lastly, how did we store it? So hopefully we've directed the questions to try to get this information and it's a unique opportunity from a nationwide resource to truly understand uh, what we have out there as a hay resource across the country. So uh, as any laboratory person would tell you, your analysis is only good as the sample. Uh, the general guideline is you should do at least a minimum of 10 cores to get a representative sample of the group or 10% of the population. So if you got 2,000 bales, I doubt many of you are gonna be that interested in coring 200 of them. But just consider, as the producer shows you their stored feed, how can I get a representative sample of the whole uh, field or the whole crop? And part of the question as you looked at these lined up uh, hay bales would be just to ask them, how did they put the bales in that uh, lot? Uh, did they make them one row at a time or did they go across? And once you know that, you can get a better idea of I probably shouldn't do five bales that are side by side, but spend some time wandering around uh, the stack, wandering around the field to get the representative sample. Again, we're going to request that you use the cores that have been provided to get the sample. Um, if you core a large number of bales, you will have a larger sample than needs to be set in the lab. So again, on the video, it's you put it in the five gallon bucket, you mix it with your hands, you pour it on the ground. You basically get all of your hay samples, you mix them together, and then take a subsample to send to the lab uh, for analysis. And hopefully the mailers and everything will be provided for you along with the forms. And we've tried to make that process as easy as possible for you. Here's the questions that we're going to have you ask the producers at the top uh, and with the supplemental table. So as we look at number one, that to me would be a subjective answer. This would be the producer saying, this is the Jones Field fescue or the uh, last year's millet or whatever, but it would have some sort of qualifier so when we send the sample back to the producer, they would know from where on the farm the sample came and then their description. 1B is using the table and to the best of your ability, trying to classify that as to what's in the hay bale. And many times producers have an idea that, well, I planted orchard grass 15 years ago um, and without looking at the field, it's pretty difficult to know exactly what's in the bale, but at least if you can identify it as a predominant grass, a predominant legume, a mixed, uh, mostly legume or mixed mostly grass, whether it's a small grain, like wheat hay, oat hay, uh, barley hay, and then again, have they mixed legumes with it. So we've tried to condense the classification category uh, as much as possible. And if it doesn't fit in either of those categories, use number seven and do the best of your ability to describe what it may be. I think we've all realized over the years there is quite a few things that are fed to cows and it's only up to farmer creativity of uh, how they can find something and uh, to feed to their cows. Uh, the cutting number, if you're in a region where they get multiple cuttings per year and the producer knows that, that would be helpful. And then was it harvested this past year, this year, uh, so month and year when harvested. Uh, the next question is just did you raise it or did you purchase it? And then we're going to try to make some estimates on does quality differ between bale types. And so hopefully everybody's uh, familiar with the small squares, with the large squares, and with round bales. 
if by chance uh, you get hay from another uh, type, uh, don't answer any of them, I guess, is the right question. And then finally, storage is important because it impacts both quality and quantity of hay being uh, delivered. So again, uncovered or unprotected, the bonnets, the sleeves in a stack under a tarp or in a barn, or again, if you see another way it's being stored, please let us know. This is a classic uh, forage analysis that will come out of uh, Dairy One, which is the lab we're going to use for this. Uh, the variables may be slightly different, but this is what a producer would be used to getting if they submit a sample to uh, Dairy One or a similar lab to Dairy One. What we're going to try to add is how this combines to what a cow needs. And so on this chart, you see a red line right under 14. You see a blue line right above 2. This is taking one specific hay and looking at the energy and the protein in that hay and graphically saying what's it look like relative to what a cow needs. And broadly, this is pretty similar. We understand that certain times post-calving, the hay will not provide enough to meet the cow's needs, and she's going to use back fat to meet her needs during that time. Conversely, uh, there are other times of the year that it should be more inadequate and help her gain weight. We will try to provide this back to you and the producer in this format. And the spreadsheet kind of is divided into two sections. The top is to allow them to benchmark the hay that they produce. Uh, Dairy One has actually got an incredibly large database of hay samples. And so basically, they characterize it as average, and then they create a range, which is basically one standard deviation above and below what has been submitted to their lab. So this is kind of helping the producer going, relative to your peers across the country who submit hay to forage labs, where does your hay fit? And so we'll highlight those variables that sit outside the normal range, if you will, for haze of others. So again, in a benchmarking sense, they can get an estimate of the quality of the hay. The bottom half of the spreadsheet is designed to sit there and say, okay, how does this hay work relative to the requirements of a cow? And we pick three categories of cows, an early lactation cow, a late gestation cow, and a maintenance cow. And so again, we will highlight those areas where we believe the hay that's been submitted for analysis does not meet the needs of those given groups. So in this case, uh, we've added comments that if you want to meet the protein needs of an early lactation cow, protein supplementation should be considered. Uh, NDF is high, thus that may influence intake. So even though the hay is adequate in nutrients, the cows may not be able to eat enough. And then likewise, this particular hay is deficient in zinc and copper and thus those should be supplemented. So our goals working through with Dave and Chuck are trying to give the producer actual information of not only here's the analysis of the hay, but what does it mean relative to the cattle on your farm. Another question we commonly get, when you get to large round bales and you look at the outside of the bale, you will usually notice, unless it's covered, that the uh, outer portion of the bale is weathered. And so many times, and I've done it myself, you kind of take your hands and you part the hay so you get rid of the bad stuff and you only get to sample the good stuff. And all I'm offering is when you look at what's in the outer six inches of a hay bale, basically a third of a six or a five foot bale is in that outer six inches. And so if you do not sample that outer covering, you're actually underestimating what's really in the bale. And of course, hopefully this visual also shows to you why it's advantageous for any producer to make bigger bales than smaller bales, because less of the hay is in that outer six inches. Another challenge in meeting the needs of cattle is how much uh, hay do you lose by the method of storage. And on this uh, slide are estimates from West Virginia University and University of Kentucky on how much hay is lost through common storage mechanisms. And so 
if we can keep the loss under 10%, we feel pretty good about ourselves, but you can see some of those numbers in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, uh, depending how you store a bale, uh, you can have tremendous loss associated with a good quality product that was put in the bale, but now you never get it in front of the cows. So just going through a real life example, uh, and our extension service in Virginia has done this multiple times. Uh, almost all farmers believe their bales are bigger than what they really are. And I will credit, I will blame that on the person who sold the baler to them that says this thing will consistently make 1,100 pound bales. Uh, when you actually go out and weigh those bales, you find out they weigh 900 pounds. We got to remember that's a combination of dry matter and uh, moisture, so it's actually only 765 pounds of dry matter. Then if our storage loss is 15%, we're down to 650. If we have a feeding loss of another 10%, we're down to 585. So I think a common challenge for many of our producers is they believe they're putting out enough hay, but if you start accounting for actual weight of the bale and losses, they may only be putting out half as much hay as they considered. Uh, sure, those cows won't eat the bad hay or the lost hay, but eventually we got to get them through the winter. And so one question that we've gotten back is, well, Doc, if I'm only feeding half as much hay as I thought, how are my cows making it through the winter? And just kind of barnyard math, just remember every pound of fat she loses is worth about four or five pounds of hay. So if the cows go into the winter plenty fat, we can really – scrimp on the hay, and unfortunately, the cows come out of the winter skinny. That's the uh, observation at the end of the day. But uh, we do rely on cows to use that body condition they gained in the summer and the fall to make through the winter. So just recognize that that back fat is part of her ability to meet her needs to go through the winter. And so finally, here's my contact information. Uh, we'll go through a series of questions now, but uh, as we go through the project or you get stuck anytime uh, as we're going through here, please give me an uh, email or give me a call, and I'll do my best to return, it, uh, return those questions or answers to you as soon as possible. So with that, I'll open it up, and what questions can we answer uh, for the group online here? And ladies and gentlemen, at this time, if you'd like to ask a verbal question, please press pound 2 on your telephone keypad to place yourself into the telephone question queue. Now to send a note, select all panelists on the Send To drop-down menu of the chat panel, which is located on the lower right-hand side of your screen, and then send a message. Once again, for a verbal question, please press pound 2 on your telephone keypad to enter the verbal question queue, and to send a note, select all panelists on the Send To drop-down menu of the chat panel. Okay, we have one question, Terry. Um, so some areas of the western U.S. may also feed alfalfa cubes. You, uh, I'm not familiar with alfalfa cubes. Can you comment on that? He, somewhat. That's a pretty uniform product. Uh, we can certainly analyze it. I don't think Chuck and I had considered that that would happen. Uh, in that sense, it's probably putting together uh, a group of cubes and sending them off. Uh, whoever sold you the cubes may actually have the analysis uh, along those lines, depending on who you uh, bought it from. But certainly they can be analyzed as well. Are those, uh, is that a pelleted product or something like that? Or, or, or how big are the cubes generally? Do, cubes do you know? tend to be off the top of my head, you know, an inch by two inches by three inches, something along those lines. They look like teeny weeny mini bales of hay. Uh, so, yeah, they're much larger than a, you don't have to process the alfalfa nearly as much to get it into a cube as you do to get it into a pellet. And, um, Interestingly, just trivia, for whatever reason, the structure of alfalfa and clover tend to lend themselves to cubes being a possibility. It's really hard to get a grass-type hay to hold together as a cube. 
but that's certainly an option. But yeah, they. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of what would be similar in size. Um, about half a cell phone big. Okay. Uh, and if they, if someone wanted to sample those, would they just take a couple of them and put them in the quart size bag? Yeah, depending how they, um, you know, again, the sampling technique of how it's delivered in cubes, if you had it, dumped in a commodity bed, you'd grab handfuls from several areas, but absolutely, yeah. And I will double check with the lab at uh, Dairy One to make sure about that, but that's the answer off the top of my head. Okay, we had a clarification that says cubes are made in the field after the alfalfa has been cut and dried similar to how it is done for baling. Right. Size is typically one and a half by two and a half to three inches. Yep. Yep. Okay, do we have any other questions? And once again, if you did have a verbal question, Please press pound 2 on your telephone keypad to enter the question queue. Otherwise, please use the, the chat panel on the lower right-hand side of your screen. Okay, we had a comment uh, offering a website where you can get more information on cubes. Otherwise, we don't have any other questions. I guess so, so thank not you for exciting as BVD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So thank you for being on this morning, Terry. All right, and uh, we'll look forward to um, going through the project. Okay. Yeah, thank you. All right. Have a good day. Okay, thanks. You too. Okay, so now we're going to uh, transition to talking about biologic sampling. And I'm going to turn it over over to Allison to talk about that. I said, this is Jason. Can you give me a presenting rights, please? Thank you. Okay. Hi, my name is Dr. Allison Wiedenhaft. You may remember that I assisted with the biologics and the equine study last year. And now I'm working with the beef team on the biologics portion of NOM's beef 2017 study. In this presentation, I am going to explain the basic instructions for the beef 2017 biologics. First, I will describe the general components of the beef biologics then I will go over the sampling timeline and the shipping schedule. Finally, I will go over the instructions for the three specific kits, the BBD kit, the fecal or FC kit, and the forage kit. Okay, here are the general components of the biologic. First, I will talk about the BBD testing. Producers will have the opportunity to collect and submit ear notch samples from their entire spring calving herd to test their calves for persistent infection, PI, with bovine viral diarrhea, BVD virus. Spring calving herd is defined as having 70% or more of the operations calves born from November 1, 2017 through July 15, 2018. 
View the VMOs and AHTs will instruct the producer how to collect two ear notches per calf for their entire spring calving herd, record the information on the collection records, and submit the samples. The producer will collect the samples throughout the spring calving season and ship on Monday through Wednesdays for testing. The sample will be shipped to Kansas State Veterinary Diagnostics Laboratory for testing. If BVD positive, the second year notch is sent to ARS for typing. KSBDL will send the results to NOMS. Then the BVD producer reports will be generated with the BVD status of each calf 14 to 21 days after the test results are reported by the lab. Producer reports will be sent to the coordinators for distribution. These reports will be sealed. Only the BVD positive and negative results will be returned to the producers. Results of genotyping determining if the calf is infected with BVD type 1A, 1B, or 2 will not be returned to the producers. Operations with positive samples will have the opportunity to retest positive calves via ear notches to verify they are persistently infected. NOMS has sent the BVD producer agreements to the state coordinators for distribution among the VMOs and AHTs. If the producer agrees to complete the BVD testing for their spring calf crop, then they must complete the BVD producer agreement. Because the producer is responsible for collecting and shipping the samples, it is important to thoroughly review the BVD producer agreement to make sure the producer understands what is involved and also to make sure the producer is eligible for the BVD testing. The BVD producer agreement needs to be completed before a BVD kit can be left to the producer. A producer can hold on to the agreement along with a business reply envelope and mail the agreement to NOMS if they decide to participate at a later date. Do not leave a kit in this case. NBSL will mail a kit directly to the producer. First, you need to ensure that the producer meets the criteria listed in Section 1 of the BVD producer agreement. Next, please record the producer's name, phone number, email address, and home address. Ensure the home address is an address that can receive packages, as this is where secondary kits will be shipped. On the BVD producer agreement, items four and five will indicate the size of the expected calf crop and the sampling shipping plans. This information will be used for getting the right numbers of kits to the producer. If producers have a large cow herd, they should be encouraged to submit two batches of samples during their calving season. Not only will this help with the laboratory flow of samples, but it also allows the producers to possibly make arrangements management decisions for their calves with early results. Several variables will affect how and when the producer takes samples. These include the size of the expected calf crop, length of calving season, the opportunity to be in the field, the ability to handle the calf, and the ability to deliver samples to the FedEx drop-off location. Using these points, help the producer decide on the best plan for collection. If a different collection scenario is decided other than the three listed in item five, you can write it down on the agreement and have the producer initial the change. The BVD producer agreement was printed on three-part carbonless paper. The white copy should be mailed to NOMS using a prepaid business reply envelope. The yellow copy is sent to the state coordinator. The pink copy is given to the producer. Check to see if a pre-addressed NOMS business reply envelope is attached to the agreement. If it is not, please attach a pre-addressed business reply envelope that will be supplied to you by NOMS. Okay, moving on to the next biological component. This slide breaks out the general components of fecal culture antimicrobial resistance testing. You, the VMOs, and HTs will collect composite fecal samples from six areas with six sites per area from cows and six areas 
with six sites per area from calves. This will result in six to 12 composite samples per operation, depending on whether calves are present. There are state-specific collection dates that I will explain later. Samples need to be shipped Monday through Wednesday only. The samples will be submitted to ARS Bear Lab and will be cultured for Salmonella, E. coli, and Enterococcus. At NBSL, Salmonella positive samples will be serogrouped and serotyped. Enterococcus speciation will be performed. Antimicrobial susceptibility testing will be done on Salmonella, E. coli, and Enterococcus isolates. ARS Bear Lab will provide NOMS with test results every other week during the study. Salmonella culture results, positive and negative results only, not serotypes, will be generated for producer reports 14 to 21 days after test results are reported by the lab. Producer reports will be sent to coordinators for distribution. Last are the general components of forward sampling. You, the VMOs, and AHTs will collect forage samples, 12 core samples, from the same lot of forage at the operation. The, core, the 12 core samples will be mixed together in a bucket. You will submit a one core sample to Dairy One Lab for nutrient analysis. Virginia Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine at Virginia Tech will provide an interpretive report of the forage analysis. Producer reports will consist of a forage quality analysis along with an interpretation of the results and will be generated 14 to 21 days after test results are reported by the lab. Producer reports will be sent to the coordinators for distribution. Now an overview of the sampling timeline and the shipping schedule. DVD ear notches can be collected by the producers from January 22nd to July 15th. The last day for BVD sample submission is July 16th. Fecal and forage samples can be collected by BS between January 22nd and April 6th. The fecal collection schedule has additional restrictions. Due to capacity limits of the ARS Bear Laboratory, <clears throat> dates have been divided into groups with sample dates and numbers of samples per week that can be submitted. Group one can collect samples from January 22nd through February 28th. Each day can submit up to 24 samples per week. Group two can collect samples from March 1st through April 6th. Each day can submit up to 24 samples per week. Group three can collect samples from January 22nd through April 6th. Again, each day can submit up to 24 samples per week. Please sample only during the dates assigned to your state sampling group. This schedule can be found in the VF manual and on the collection, fecal collection forms. Try to schedule your VS visits to correspond with your group dates. Each biologic has additional collection and shipping requirements. BVD samples can be collected and placed in the producer's freezer any day of the week. However, samples should be shipped on ice only on Monday through Wednesday. Samples should never be shipped Thursday through Sunday or before a holiday. Samples cannot be submitted from July 2nd to July 4th. Fecal samples need to be collected Sunday through Wednesday, refrigerated if they will not be shipped on the collection day, and shipped within 24 hours. Samples collected on Sunday need to be refrigerated and shipped on Monday. Poor hay samples can be collected any day of the week and shipped Monday through Saturday. Now I will discuss the biologic kits. Training kits were mailed out to the state coordinators and you may want to look through these kits as I go over them if you have them. The BVD kit and the fecal culture antimicrobial testing kit, also called the fecal kit or FC kit, both are contained in a shipping box. 
The forward sampling kit is contained in the shipping envelope. Each kit has a sticker on the outside of the cardboard box or envelope that identifies the kit type and the kit number. You will need the kit number in order to complete the data collection form. Inside the cardboard box for BBD and FC kits, on top of the styrofoam cooler, you will find the kit paperwork, which includes the data collection forms, instructions for how to collect samples and complete the forms, and the prepaid, preprinted FedEx shipping label. The BBD kits also have a prepaid business reply envelope. Each kit box contains a styrofoam cooler, cooler packs, an absorbent sheet to soak up spills, the supplies needed to collect samples, and a permanent ink marker. Please be sure to freeze the cooler packs prior to shipping. The forage envelope contains data collection forms, a labeled courtside sample bag, additional FedEx shipping envelope, a prepaid, preprinted FedEx shipping bill, and a permanent ink marker. The first type of kit I will describe in detail is the BBD kit. The BBD kits are different from the rest of the kits because they will be used by the participant to collect and submit samples to KSBDL. You, the VMO, and HT will need to open the primary BBD kit box, write the state and the operation number and kit IDs on the data collection forms, and go over the sampling and submission instructions with the participants. I will go over these steps in detail in the next slides. There are three types of BVD kits, a primary BVD kit, a secondary BVD kit, and a retest kit. Primary, BV, primary kits will be usually be delivered by you, the VMOs and AHTs, and contain all the collection samples needed, including an ear notcher. If the producer is undecided about participating and you leave a blank BVD producer agreement at the operation, NDSL will mail the primary kits directly to the producer if they decide to participate. Please inform NOMS that you left a blank BVD producer agreement at the operation so that we could be aware that a kit will need to be ordered. Secondary BVD kits can either be shipped directly to the producer or be delivered by you during the VS visit if samples will be sent to the lab in batches or if the expected calf crop exceeds 150. The BVD agreement form will inform NOMS that these operations will need a secondary kit shipped directly to them. These secondary kits contain more supplies but do not contain an ear matcher. If a secondary kit is left at the operation during the VS visit, please let NOMS know so that we do not send them an additional kit. Retest kits can be requested by the producer if one or more of the calves test positive at the operation. The paperwork inside the BVD kits include instructions, collection record forms, a prepaid business reply envelope, and a prepaid FedEx air bill. The data collection record consists of two pages printed on three-part carbonless paper. With a ballpoint pen, fill out the state and operation number for the producer and show them where these numbers can be found on the producer agreement. Keep your own personal record of the NOMS ID and kit ID. Review the BVD instructions with the producer. Instruct the producer how to fill out the data collection forms and the sample labels. Make sure they understand that they need to use a ballpoint pen to fill out the collection forms, confirming that the ink goes through all three pages, and use the provided marker to fill out the sample labels. The sample number and the CAF ID on the sample bag need to match the sample number and CAF ID on the data collection form. One hundred and fifty labeled World Pack bundled sample bags are included in the kits. The kit ID on the labeled sample bags should match the kit number on the shipping box. Using the permanent marker provided, the producer will need to record the CAF ID and check the age range on the sample labels. Three large Ziploc bags are included in each kit. The producer will need to place the World Pack bags in one of the freezer one of the Ziploc bags and freeze the samples as soon as possible.
Ear notches are provided in all primary BVD kits. Producers may have their own ear notcher that they would rather use. A step-by-step -step colored collection instruction pictorial was provided in the kits to guide the producer with the collection process. Go over this pictorial with the producer and make sure they are comfortable with this ear notch collection process. It is critical that the base of the notcher is set fully on the calf's ear. The lab needs a full triangle cut in order to test. Instruct them to fully set the notcher over the ear and squeeze, and then place the ear notch in the sample bag. It is okay for the sample to include hair. The second ear notch should be taken from the same calf and placed in the bag with the first ear notch. The second sample can be from either ear of the calf. Instruct the producer how to disinfect the ear notches between the calves. Explain to the producer that the three-part data collection forms will need to be separated when submitting the samples. The two white pages should be placed inside the provided self-addressed prepaid envelope and mailed back to NOMS. The two yellow copies should be shipped with the kit to KSBDL. It should be sealed in a Ziploc bag and placed on top of the styrofoam lid before the participant closes the cardboard box. The producer will keep the two pink copies for the records. Please instruct the producers to freeze the cooler packs prior to shipping. After the producer places the frozen cooler pack inside the styrofoam box with the frozen labeled samples and inserts the yellow form on top of the styrofoam box, the producer can seal the cardboard shipping box with tape and stick the FedEx air bill that is pre-addressed to KSBDL on top of the cardboard box. The producer will need to write an estimated weight of the package on the top right-hand corner of the air bill. Please be sure the producer understands the shipping day restrictions. Frozen samples packed with frozen cooler packs can only be shipped Monday through Wednesday. There is no shipping July 2nd through July 4th. Operations in which any calf tests positive for BVDPI will have the opportunity to retest their calf using the retest kit. This confirmatory test will help rule out calves with transient BVD infections. This is a small kit that will include the essential paperwork and sampling supplies. This kit will be shipped directly to the producer. In summary, although the BVD kit is owner collected and submitted, the VMO or HT has several key responsibilities. Please be sure to fill out the state and operation number and kit number on top of both pages of the collection record. Keep a record of the NOMS ID and kit number for all the operations. Instruct the participant on sample collection, data recording, and shipping procedures. And be sure the participant understands these instructions. The next set of kits I'll be describing are the fecal kits, which are labeled FC kits. The paperwork inside the FC kits include collection forms, sample labels, and a prepaid FedEx air bill. The 14 sample bags that are included in the kits are not labeled, so you, the VMOs, and HTs will need to attach the labels onto the sample bags. Fill out the three-part carbonless collection form with a ballpoint pen. On the collection record, check the area at which the sample was collected. Area examples include an area near the water source, an area near feeding grounds, and an alleyway leading to a pasture or a field. Be sure the sample number on the labeled sample bag matches the sample number and area on the collection form. Include the yellow copy with the samples. Send the white copy to your coordinator. The producer will keep the pink copy. A four-page supplemental collection record is attached to the carbon lens collection record. Please fill out these pages and send them to your coordinator. Do not send the, supp the supplemental collection records in with the samples. The fecal samples are collected by you, the NEMOs, and the HTs and will include a 6 or 12 
fecal composite samples per operation, depending on whether the calves are present. Collect fecal, collect fresh manure or fecal pad samples from six different areas where adult cows congregate. If calves are present, collect an additional six area samples where calves congregate. Each composite area should consist of six sites with two ounces, a golf ball size, of manure sampled from each site. Close the whirl pack bag by squeezing out the air, rolling the bag twice, and twisting the twist ties together. Place the six or 12 sample bags in a gallon Ziploc bag and cool down with frozen ice packs. Keep the samples cool, but do not freeze them. If the samples will not be shipped on the day of collection, store them in the refrigerator overnight. Collect and ship samples according to your state assigned collection schedule. Freeze the cooler packs prior to collection and shipping. Samples need to be shipped via FedEx overnight delivery on a Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. Place the completed and clearly readable yellow copy of the data collection record on top of the styrofoam lid before closing the cardboard shipping box. If an extra Ziploc bag is available, you can insert the yellow form inside a Ziploc bag before sitting it on top of the cooler. Tape the box closed. Place the FedEx shipping label on the box and add the box weight on the shipping label. Send the white copy of the data collection form and the supplemental collection form to your coordinator within three days. The last kit I will be describing are the forage kits. The contents in the forage kits include a data collection record form, a prepaid FedEx air bill, shipping envelope, labeled quart size sample bag, and a permanent marker. Use the permanent marker to record the nonce ID on the sample bag. Fill out the three-part carbonless collection record with a ballpoint pen, making sure all three copies are legible. The yellow copy will be sent with the four samples to the Dairy One Lab in Ithaca, New York. Send the white copy to your coordinator and leave the pink copy with the producer. A forged table is included with the paperwork and is needed to answer question 1B on the collection record. Enter one of the seven forged type options provided in the table for question 1B. Three Penn State forged samplers were provided to each state coordinator, and they contain the following parts. An 18-inch hollow probe to collect the samples, a 3 8 inch round shank adapter for use with electric or battery-powered gel, and a dowel plunger to remove the pack samples. It is the responsibility of the coordinators to distribute the forged probes to, to the VMOs or HTs as needed for sample collection. The probe can be used with an electric or battery-powered drill. Hay is removed from the probe by disengaging the barrel from the chuck adapter by depressing a spring-loaded button. Then use the dowel plunger to deposit each hay core sample into a bucket. The producer should select the type of hay to be tested. NOMS is only offering testing of baled hay, not haylage, baleage, or silage. The forage the cow herd is currently being fed is preferred. The selected forage should be from the same field and cutting number, for example, second cutting from a specific field. We call this the forage lot. Multiple bales should be sampled from the same lot, and at least 12 core samples should be collected and combined in a bucket. After mixing the core samples in a bucket, fill a one quart size Ziploc bag with the mixed hay. There will be leftover hay in the bucket. Okay, now we're going to switch over to the forage collection video in which Dr. Chuck Fossler will demonstrate how to collect the core samples using the forage probe. This video is about 20 minutes. AT&T moderator, can you switch us?
Absolutely. Switching to the video now. And before we begin the video, there is a quick note. Please note that the sound for this video will rely on audio from your computer. Please ensure that the speakers on your computer are unmuted. To view the video in full screen mode, please double click the video in window. And the playback of this video will be contingent on your bandwidth. The video will be playing now. I'm Chuck Fossler, and I've taken over for Dave Dargitz as a study lead for the NAMS cow-calf study that started back in October. And first off, I, I wanted to thank you all for the work that you do for NAMS, and we couldn't do these studies without the, without your help, so we appreciate all the, the, all the work that you do. Uh, for the uh, cow, the cow-calf study, one of the incentives that we're offering is uh, to take a forage sample and test it for nutrient content. This is going to be done free, to, free of charge to the producer. And today I'm going to be showing you how to take a forage sample. So we're going to be distributing three forage probes per state to be used in forage sampling. And the probes are designed to be used with a drill, a cordless drill or an electric drill. And I first off wanted to emphasize that if you don't have a forage probe and you don't have a drill, then you shouldn't be taking a sample because it's not going to be representative of the nutrient content of the bales of hay. So, so that, that's the first thing, that, that you need a probe and you need a drill in order to take a sample. Um, I mean, you might think that you can pull out uh, like loose hay from the top of the bales like this, but again, this isn't a very representative sample of the bale. You really need to uh, get a core through the bale and that'll give you a, an idea of the nutrient content of the bale. Uh, the other thing um, that you need to know is when you get to the operation, if the producer wants to have a forage sample tested, you need to ask him what forage that he wants tested. Um, the forage needs to be from the same field and the same cutting number. So all the bales you sample need to be from the same field and cutting number. For example, like second cutting or second crop of alfalfa from a particular field. And so you'll have, need to ask the producer where bales from that field and cutting number are located. Each sample should consist of, a, of, a, of 12 or more cores from the bales. Um, and you're going to be dealing with lots of different scenarios. You could be sampling bales from a 10-acre hay field or a 200-acre hay field, or it could be even from a waterway. So there's going to be lots of different numbers of bales from that field and cutting number. So you'll need to decide how to uh, take a representative sample of those bales based on how many there are. And each core sample should prefer preferably be from a, from a different bale. And we are uh, supplying you with what's known as the Penn State Forage Sampler. This has a cutting end and an end that attaches to the drill. And it has a dowel for forcing the hay out after each sample. You, after each sample, you need to disconnect it from the drill and take off the end. The end, when you first get it, the spring clip is kind of stiff and it's a little hard to get off, but it gets better as it gets used more. And then to force the sample out, you push the dowel down and it comes out this end. This is the end that attaches to the drill. When you first get them, this is very smooth. As you can see, the drill will cut some grooves in it similar to that. And so uh, in order to use this, you'll need a half-inch drill. Half-inch drill means that when the uh, 
opening for the bit is open to the widest part. The diameter is a half an inch across. And you'll need that. A quarter inch drill wouldn't work with this because this is more than a quarter inch in diameter. And so it's So you would tighten it like so, and you'll want to make sure that the drill is in the forward position, and when it's in the forward position, as I'm looking at it, it's going clockwise. Usually a drill will have a button like this. One way will be forward and the other way will be reverse. So you want it in the forward position when you start drilling. And one thing to note about these probes is that these teeth are kind of fragile. If you drop these on a hard surface, you can break them. So try to be careful and not drop them. So we'll move on to, uh, to taking a sample. I, I highly recommend that you have a pail. It's going to be a lot easier to unload the forage probe if you have a pail. Most home stores will sell five gallon pails for three dollars a piece. That's where I got this. I got this at Lowe's. It's three dollars. But I, again, highly recommend this because it's going to be a lot easier to uh, unload the sample using this. And so I'll move on to showing how to take a core sample on round bales. Probably big round bales are probably what you're going to encounter the most. Some farms will have small square bales and some will have lar large square bales. A little later we're going to go and take a sample from a large square bale to show you how to get a sample from one of those. But on our round bale, you want to sample the curved part of the bale. You don't want to do the end, you want the curved part. And so in order to take a sample, um, round bales are going to be, you're going to encounter lots of different types. Some will just have twine around it. Some will have kind of a netting. That's what this has. You can see there's a netting in here. And others, you might encounter some that are wrapped in plastic on the curved part of the bale. If it's wrapped in plastic, you're going to have to go through the plastic in order to get a sample. On one like this, you can kind of move the twine out of the way so that you're just going into the hay, like so. And so when you get ready to drill, you press the trigger and then you reverse. Like I said, you'll need to remove the probe each time, and because this is metal, the friction of drilling in is going to make this get hot, so it, I recommend that you wear a pair of gloves when you're doing this. It can be easier to get this thing open if you have a pen or maybe I'm using a punch and to unload the probe you push the dowel in on the cutting end and force it out into the pail. So that's one sample. And like I said, we want you to take 12, 12 cores, or sorry, this was one core. We want you to take 12 cores to get an adequate sample. And and some hay is going to be easier to drill into than others. I found that alfalfa is easier to drill in than grass hay. What I'm drilling into here is grass hay. 
and ideally I might go one bale over and do every other one in this line but because we're dealing with a situation where we don't have very good light back in there I'm going to stick with this bale and do the ones that have good light so again it's the same uh, procedure Make sure the drill is in the right forward or reverse. If the hay is really dry, it might start to fall out when you pull this end out. So that's core number two. And this is core number 12. So that's, those are all the cores that we need to take. And so this is how much hay 12 cores made up. Comes up to about here on the pail. So the next step is to uh, we're having you put the samples in a quart size bag and it will have a uh, it should have the label pre-attached when you get it I haven't put the label on the bag yet. This isn't just the type of bag you're going to get. This is one I brought from home. The type you get won't have the right on label like this. But uh, so the label will have the kit number, the fact that it's forage, beef 2017 study, and you'll need to write in the NAMS ID. We should be providing you with one of these pens. And you would just want to write in the NAMS ID. It's probably best if you do this before you come out. Uh, it'll be uh, four, uh, typically the first two digits are the state and you know the, the next four of the NAMS ID number. And then you'll want to mix up the sample and make sure it's thoroughly mixed. It's also good to have gloves to do this. And the five gallon bucket makes it if, if it's windy, the wind's not going to pick it up near as easily in a bucket this size. And when you get it thoroughly mixed, then Put 
put a couple handfuls in the bag. Get as much air out as you can and seal the bag. And then this will go in a Tyvek envelope that it will already be pre-addressed to the uh, Dairy One Lab in Ithaca, New York. So you'll put the bag in, uh, or we'll have an air bill for you that'll have the Dairy One's address on it. And you put that on the envelope and put it in, uh, reg it'll be going to FedEx, it'll be in a FedEx envelope, so it'll go FedEx. Then you put it in the mail and it'll, uh, be delivered to the Dairy One lab. This doesn't need any refrigeration. It can just go straight in the envelope and be mailed. Um, if you can't get it out that day, you can mail it the next day, and it, this doesn't need to be refrigerated overnight. Um, I forgot to mention one thing that I mentioned that some of the bales will have a plastic wrap around the covered surface. If you encounter bales that are completely wrapped, usually those will be in white plastic wrapping. Those are, uh, that's baleage or haylage, and we're not including that as part of the study because those samples would need to be handled differently when they're shipped to the lab. Those would need to be put in a refrigerator or freezer overnight. and. And so we're not going to include those. We're only including hay samples as part of the study. Okay, and next we're going to go over and see how to do a large square bale. Okay, now I want to show you how to do a large square bale. These are large square bales. You can see the outline of the bale is here. And on square bales, you want to sample from the end, from like here. You don't want to sample from the sides. You want to do it from the end. And small square bales are the same as large square bales in that you sample from the end, like this. And one of the things I forgot to mention over there doing round bales is that you can only, you should only be sampling what you can safely get to. Um, some bales are going to be tucked behind others, and you won't be able to get to them. And, in this stack of bales, I wouldn't sample anything higher than about three high, because it wouldn't be safe to do any, anything other than that. So to do a large square bale, it's similar to the others. You attach the probe to the drill, make sure it's in the forward position. Reverse the drill, and do the same thing. Since I'm I'm only doing one sample here. I'm not going to empty it into a pail. I mainly just wanted to do that just to show you how sampling large bales is different from round, or how, how square bales are different from round bales as to how you sample them. That's all that I had on taking a forward sample. After filling the sample bag with the mixed core samples, seal the sample bag and insert it and a yellow copy of the forage collection form into the provided FedEx shipping envelope. Attach the FedEx air bill that is pre-addressed to Dairy One Forge Lab and add the envelope weight to the label. Coordinators, please send emails for kit requests and questions to Abby's ear. Ship the white copies of the collection records to NOMS using the address on the slide. You should plan on shipping the forms to NOMS weekly or as necessary to allow NOMS to stay up to date with tracking, data entry, and reporting. This completes my instructions for the B2017 Biologics. Thank you for your attention. We truly appreciate the work you will be doing in the field to ensure quality samples and accurate data. So we'll open it up to questions now, and the whole team is going to be here to answer questions. And ladies and gentlemen, at this time, if you'd like to ask a question, please press pound 2 on your telephone keypad to enter the verbal question queue. To send in a written question, use the chat panel on the lower right-hand side of your screen. 
And from the Send to drop-down menu, select All Panelists. Once again, it is pound 2 on your telephone keypad to enter the telephone question queue. And to send in a written question, use the chat panel on the lower right-hand side of your screen. Okay, we have a question. How is the core cleaned or disinfected between premises? And as far as I know, I don't think the core needs to be cleaned, but I will check with Dr. Swecker and verify that. Um, it definitely doesn't need to be disinfected between premises. It's not really going to retain much forage in it after you use the, the uh, probe to, clean, to push it all out. So um, I don't think it needs to be cleaned, but I'll check, uh, verify that with Dr. Swecker. And, and that is one of the reasons why I elected not to include baleage or haylage in it, because then it probably would need to be cleaned it, between premises, because there would be stuff that would stick in there. So I'll check with you. and if. If you need to clean it, then I'll, I'll send out a, a note to the coordinators. And we did have one question on the telephone line. Caller, your line has been unmuted. Yeah, I just typed it down in the chat panel too, but what if they fed all the 2018 hay crop and there's 2017 hay crop and there's no hay to sample? Can we use the 2018 hay crop? Oh, you can use whatever hay he has available. I mean, it, it doesn't. It's easiest to use what he's being, what he's feeding right now. But you can sample any hay that he wants to be tested. Okay, thank you. And once again, if you did have a question, please press pound two on your telephone keypad to enter the verbal question queue. And if you'd like to send in a written question. Please use the chat panel on the lower right-hand side of your screen. Sue so had a question, are data collectors to wear PPE during farm visits for biosecurity? Um, if you're taking fecal samples, you would need to have boots. It's best to have boots and coveralls that you would change between premises, um, and you would need to clean the boots between visits. But no, you don't need to wear Tyvek coveralls to do this sampling. And again, to ask a question, please press pound 2 on your telephone keypad to enter the question queue. And to send in a written question, use the chat panel on the lower right-hand side of your screen. I have a question for coordinators. Um, we got uh, some word that um, some of the cutting ends of the probes had uh, disengaged, that the screw holding them on had come loose. Have many of you uh, experienced that? I just heard of a couple coordinators that had that happen. Um, are you in need of a screw to replace that? Those cutting ends are designed to be able to be removed in case they get broken. So, um, but I assume if that screw comes out, it would be easy to get lost. And if you have experienced that, you can send us an email and let us know. We have another question. What data collection is restricted to BMOs and what may AHTs perform? Um, uh, 
I, there aren't any restrictions. Uh, HCs can do whatever the VMOs can. Well, this is Abby, and I'll jump in maybe while you're thinking of a question. Uh, we're told that these uh, recordings will be available within like 72 hours, so I w once I get them, I will get them to the coordinators early next week, and then it will be up to the coordinators to go ahead and, and get that to their field. And then uh, that forage video will also be posted to our website, and uh, I'm thinking it will probably play a little smoother than it did today for us. <clears throat> And it looks like a question came in. Yeah, we got a question with fecal samples. The state can only submit 24 samples. So that would mean from four farms with only cow samples or two farms with both cow and calf samples. Yeah, that's 24 samples per week per state. And so, yes, you're correct. Got a question, where is the website? Where we're well, your coordinator should have that for you, but I can uh, email that to you, Mary, when I get back to my desk. It's also in the manual. So I had a question, can all participant operations have fecal samples culturing performed? The only restrictions on fecal sampling are um, we, our lab is limited in, compa in capacity, so that's why we have the restrictions on how many samples you can submit per week. As long as you stick to that limitation, then any, uh, any operation at once can have fecal samples taken. We got another question. All data collectors must sign confidentiality agreements, correct? Yes, that's correct. That agreement can be found on the SharePoint site, and I was supposed to email it out to the coordinators yesterday and didn't, so I will do that uh, when I get back to my desk today. You should try to coordinate um, your fecal sample collections with the questionnaire visit. So when you call, to schedule the, the appointment, find out if they're interested in the fecal samples, and if they are, then try to schedule it during your um, scheduling period. Another question, most calves will be in close proximity to cows during the sampling time frame. What do we do for fecal sampling in this instance? Um, I'm not quite sure what you're asking. If calves are present, then you can also take samples from calves. But if calves are not present at the time, you can only take samples from cows. I 
it's possible that you might not be able to tell the difference between a calf's fecal pad and a cow's fecal pad, but generally it should be, if it's all mixed together, then you can't just detect the difference. So you shouldn't, it's best not to take a sample there if you are not sure if it's a cow or a calf sample, but um, generally you should be able to tell the difference between a calf sample and a cow sample. Another question, are we supposed to order enough kits for every possible participant or wait until we know if the producer is going to participate before determining the number of kits to order? So I don't think ordering a kit for every possible participant is a good idea, uh, but I do recommend getting a few on hand, and the turnaround time is pretty quick on those as well, so um, that's, that's what we recommend. Yes, kids can uh, be shipped directly to the field personnel. Yes, I want hard copies of the confidentiality form. You can uh, just send those in when you send in a first batch of paperwork. That's fine. So when you order the kits, you're just you're going to send an email to me, Abby, and you're going to say, you know, how many kits you want, and if you want them shipped somewhere, then you need to provide me that name, address, and phone number. And then uh, I fill out a form for NBSL, and when they ship it, I will then in turn let the coordinator know when they were shipped and when they can be expected. With, I think they'll also provide me with the kit ID, because you'll be wanting to track some of that stuff on your ends, too. Well, I think if you come up with other questions, uh, you are always welcome to email Chuck or myself or Allison. Our presenters were gracious enough to provide their contact information, so you can certainly reach out to them, too, on stuff. Right, and uh, since we don't have any more questions, I want to thank you all for being on the call today. And like Abby said, feel free to contact us if you have more questions. I got several questions yesterday that I haven't been able, haven't had time to answer yet, so I'll be working on that the rest of the week. Okay, so thank you again for being on the call. Bye. Thank you all for joining us today. The conference is now concluded, and you may now disconnect. Once again, the conference is now concluded, and you may now disconnect.